Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Tan Suk Sam, hepatologist from Salaya Hospital. First of all, I would like to thank the College of Physicians Malaysia for inviting me to talk on liver transplantation, when to refer and the selection criteria. Dr. Abinesh informed that the objective of my talk should be to increase the awareness in the area of liver transplantation. And I will try to cover these uh, uh, topics. But first of all, let me clarify that uh, my talk will be based on liver transplant in the context of our country. And uh, we do not have a formal uh, written protocol. Um, so my presentation will be based on um, my personal experience. Uh, and I will try to present some literatures and also uh, communications with um, uh, other members of the transplant team in Malaysia. So we can start with a little bit of history. The first human liver transplantation was performed by Thomas Stars in 1963. That was a long time ago, even before I was born. And it took another four years before we have a successful first extended survival of liver transplantation in 1967. And in 1990, the first successful living donor liver transplantation was carried out. And liver transplant only came to Malaysia in the Ministry of Health in 2002, whereby the first liver transplant was performed in Salaya Hospital. Our program is small compared to other countries uh, which perform liver transplantation according to the International Registry in Organ Donation and Transplantation. Our surgeons uh, written a manuscript and published in, in Transplantation 2021 on the liver transplantation in Malaysia, the needs, obstacles, and opportunities. And I quote, according to the authors, the barriers to liver transplant in Malaysia were the low disease or uh, donation rates, the lack of knowledge among caregivers as to which patients should be referred for potential liver transplantation, disparity between health services provided in the East and West Malaysia, contrasting social, economic, and uh, disparate geopolitical background coupled with an unforgiving terrain in East Malaysia made provisions of healthcare patchy and, and, and unequal. Liver transplantation has, been, has not been a healthcare priority. And they also mentioned that cultural, religious, uh, religious belief and social taboos or barriers to liver transplant. However, moving forward, our surgeons say some encouraging signs to look forward to in terms of increasing numbers of Malaysians willing to donate and consenting to organ donations. Our surgical colleagues have performed various liver transplantation techniques. The conventional technique whereby the artery of the organ is joined to the artery of the recipient the uh, ducts join to ducts, and the veins are joined to veins, and the IVC joined to IVC. They have also done piggyback technique, whereby the IVC of the organ is joined to the recipient in the piggyback technique. They have also done split liver. A diseased donor liver organ can be split into right and left. The right lobe is given to an adult, the left lobe to given to a pediatric. So one donor organ benefited two recipients, an adult and a pediatric patients. We have also done living uh, donor liver transplantation. It started with the left lobe liver transplantation, adult donating the left lobe to a child. And subsequently, we have also done adult to adult, whereby an adult donated the right lobe to another adult in living donor liver transplantation. We work together to make the best use of donated organs and to avoid wasting organs and to avoid futile transplants. We were guided by three important principles. The urgency, that means allocation to patients estimated to have the shortest survival without a transplant. Utility, allocation to patients estimated to have longest post-transplant survival. Transplant benefit, 
allocation based on difference between the mean survival estimate with or without a transplant. Urgency is very easy to determine. However, utility and transplant benefits is rather hard to judge and there is no uh, measurable terms, parameters to, to guide uh, our judgment. This slide shows the indications and the contraindications to liver transplant. The indications are acute liver failure, acute and chronic liver failure, chronic liver failure with features of decompensations, which are jaundice, ascites, hepatic encephalopathy, MELT 15 and above, hepatocellular carcinoma. Contraindications in our centers, we do not transplant patients with HIV. We do not transplant patients with severe extrahepatic disease. We have predicted mortality above 50% at five years, including psychiatric disorder, severe irre irreversible pulmonary disease, ongoing alcohol misuse, active illicit drug use, certain anatomical variants, ongoing extrahepatic sepsis, active or previous extrahepatic malignancy, and liver cancer outside criteria, when they have inadequate social support, smoking, extensive previous abnormal surgery, BMI above 40, advanced age above 60, poor clinic attendance or adherence. There are other non-liver failure indications, which are hepatocellular carcinoma, hepatopulmonary syndrome, persistent intractable pruritus, polycystic kidney disease, recurrent cholangitis, familial amyloidosis, nodular regenerative hyperplasia, uh, other uh, uh, uncommon liver diseases, glycogen storage disease, and, and, and et cetera, et cetera. So back to the indications, I would like to spend the next few minutes to describe about acute liver failure, acute chronic liver failure, and chronic liver failure with features of decompensation. As in other diseases in medicine, the first few steps that's important to improve the management of a patient is actually identifying and making the right diagnosis. So there is a spectrum of liver failures. The liver responses to an acute hepatic insult depends on the underlying uh, liver condition prior to the decompensation and the time frame from insult to presentation with decompensation and the reversibility when the acute insult is mitigated. In a person with normal liver, with an acute insult, the patient can get acute liver failure. In a person with chronic liver disease or compensated cirrhosis, acute insults can cause liver failure in terms of acute on chronic liver failure and the patient develop jaundice and ascites. Compensated cirrhosis and decompensated cirrhosis who suffer acute insult can have the first or repeated decompensation as uh, variceal bleed, hepatic encephalopathy, ascites, renal impairment, sepsis, or a combination of any sequence. And if they were decompensated cirrhosis before, if they have another acute insult, they can have further worsening of decompensation uh, with sepsis, bleeding, and AKI. First, I would like to talk about acute liver failure. It is a medical emergency. Fortunately, it's rare, about 10 cases per million person per year. This is what a liver from acute liver failure look like. It's a very collapsed liver. And it's defined by an INR of 1.5 and above, and any degree of mental alterations, which is encephalopathy in a patient without pre-existing cirrhosis and with an illness of 24, 26 weeks duration. There are many, many uh, uh, criteria uh, and uh, classifications of acute liver failure. And the, the one that we tend to use is hyperacute, acute, and subacute, determined by the duration from jaundice to encephalopathy. Very importantly, hepatic encephalopathy is crucial to diagnose acute liver failure, although this can be subtle and need intensive screening for hepatic encephalopathy to be identified. So, Acute liver failure is not the same as acute liver injury. Acute liver injury patients do not have hepatic encephalopathy, but they may have very high ALT 
bilirubin and INR. And secondary acute liver failure is different from the normal acute liver failure that we could help patients with. That secondary acute liver failure is usually due to a systemic disease and is not indication for transplant. A systemic disease could be malignant infiltrations, infections, or ischemic hepatitis. It is very important to predict who needs a precious liver in acute liver failure. And there are various criteria, but the King's College criteria is the most widely used. It is a very robust prediction of death, but unable to reliably determine who will survive. So the King's College criteria are, uh, are based on whether they're due to uh, based, the acute liver failure is due to paracetamol or non-paracetamol. In the paracetamol acute liver failure, the arterial pH of less than 1.7.3 after resuscitation and more than 24 hours after ingestion is an indication. Lactate, high lactate of more than 3.5 and all of the below, INR more than 6.5, creatinine above 300, hepatic encephalopathy grade 3 or, uh, and uh, 4 are indications. In the non-paracetamol, INR above 6.5 or three of the five following criteria, which is the cause, indeterminate cause of hepatitis, drug-induced hepatitis, age less than 10 or more than 70, the interval between jaundice and encephalopathy was more than seven days, bilirubin above 300, INR 3.5, above 3.5. The positive, positive predictive values of the King's College, College criteria is about 70 to 100%. And the negative predictive value is about 25 to 94 percent. So it's a relatively sensitive test, but not very specific. I'd like to describe uh, and share a case that we had before. This patient, uh, a male, a gentleman, was uh, admitted to hospital one with jaundice. He stayed for about a week and he subsequently developed fever when he was transferred to hospital too. And he discharged himself as he was not getting better and he presented to our hospital. On arrival to our hospital, which is the third, third week of illness, he was already very lethargic. On day one, um, he was noted to be drowsy, but subsequently become more alert. And on day two, he developed grade one hepatic encephalopathy. He satisfied transplant criteria being high bilirubin of uh, of 547, prolonged INR, the PTC was 42 seconds, and his uh, jaundice to encephalopathy at that time was already more than seven days. So by day three, in the morning, late morning, he, his encephalopathy become worsened. He started to pull out his arterial line. It was decorticating, has hyperreflexia and proneness. He required to be intubated. And as I mentioned, as King's uh, satisfies King's College criteria for non-paracetamol overdose. And luckily, on day five towards the evening, we uh, know of a potential um, um, disease donor liver organ, and he managed to be transplanted on day six. He survived, and he is currently still well uh, seen in our combined clinic. Our patient was very lucky, but nearly 60% of the waitlisted patients with acute liver failure do not undergo a liver transplant. This is either due to clinical improvement or development of contraindications to liver transplant. So what are the contraindications? It could be active malignancy, active uh, in, uh, HIV, or, or there is a severe uh, uh, fixed mental impairment. There can be uh, so, psychosocial barriers for compliance to medical advice, medications or follow-up, um, substance use disorder and or lack of social support. It could be due to severe multi-organ failure, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, ventilation failure, more than 90% FiO2 is required with high PIP and uh, ARDS picture and acidosis. Hemodynamic instability requiring two or more vasopressors, uncontrolled sepsis, or there is irreversible brain injury like cerebral herniations or severe intracranial bleeding, which can happen in acute liver failure patients. 
Next, I would like to talk on acute and chronic liver failure. This diagram pictures the, the clinical cause of liver cirrhosis. In a person with liver, with a liver disease, it, it spent a long time, about one to three decades in the pre uh, disease stage, asymptomatic. And this, if the, if the cause of the liver disease is not treated, patients may end up with uh, compensated cirrhosis at the end of it and spend about 10 to 15 years in this stage, again, with mild or no symptoms. And then if the treatment is still not uh, given, the patient can end up with decompensated cirrhosis. And this is really the watershed mom moment. And, and the patient uh, would have a median survival drop dramatically to about two years or 12 years. And the patient will be in this stage about for another three to five years. And the patient may die uh, or uh, may have been lucky to get receive a liver transplantation. During the stage of compensated cirrhosis, the patient at any time can develop acute or chronic liver failure. This is usually due to a precipitating events, which can be due to excessive alcohol, drug-induced, a viral hepatitis, ischemic hepatitis, some procedures, and also other uh, bacterial infections. And but also a significant number of them do not have an identifiable precipitating event. Acute or chronic liver failure is marked by acute decompensation, organ failures, and high short-term mortality. Patient can have kidney failures, coagulation problems, circulatory problems, and also ventilatory uh, support is needed. So in a person with cirrhosis, if they uh, need to come to hospital in an emergency for an acute decompensation, you can expect about 30% of them actually have ACLF. And in the patients with ACLF, 30% of the patients end up with mortality or a liver transplant, how, how, uh, while 70% of them will uh, survive this episode, but will be high risk of further decompensation and mortality. So ACLF it is also an emergency hepatology condition. There are a few criteria for diagnosis of ACLF. Uh, two most commonly used ones are the APASO and the ESO. APASO for Asia Pacific, ESO is European. So the APASO criteria, ACLF is in acute hepatic insults, uh, manifesting as jaundice, which is a serum bilirubin above 85 uh, millimoles per liter, coagulopathy INR above 1.5, complicated within four weeks with clinical ascites and encephalopathy in the patients with previously diagnosed or undiagnosed chronic liver disease or cirrhosis and is associated with a high uh, uh, 28 days mortality. This criteria, I find it very useful because it's really a bedside uh, parameters that you can use and the ascites and encephalopathy are clinical manifestation to define this condition. The European criteria, the European CLIF criteria is um, uh, ACLF is defined as acute decompensation of cirrhosis associated with organ failure with high short-term mortality, 28 days mortality of more than or equal to 15%. And the, the presence and numbers of organ failure as, as defined in this table involving the liver, kidneys, brain, coagulation, circulation, and respiratory. When we have diagnosed an acute or chronic liver failure based on the criteria that I've mentioned, the next thing to do is to identify the acute insult and try to treat it. If alcohol is the acute insult, we consider steroids. If hepatitis B, the acute insult, consider antiviral. If it's AIH steroids, if it's drug-induced liver injuries, stop the culprit and uh, maybe consider plasmapheresis for Wilson's considered treatment and plas plasmapheresis. And sometimes um, our patients are very, very helpful and the leave clue uh, as to the cause of the acute insult, as in my patient here who went to the toilet when I was doing uh, rounds. So you have identified 
uh, this patient has a CLF and have identified the acute insult and try your best to treat it. The next thing to do is to do scoring system, the R score. So the R score is, the, is actually based on a large database uh, of patients in Asia Pacific and Malaysia contributed to this database. And from the database, we know what are the predictors of the 28 days mortality, which are the INR, serum creatinine, total bilirubin, lactate, and hepatic encephalopathy. And we found that the ARC score actually performed better with an AURC of 0.84 compared to other scores like the SOFA score, the MELT score, the Apache score, and the European Cliff C score. And you can use the ARC calculator and give a score of the patients with ACLF. And if you use as the ARC score, uh, uh, it can predict the outcome of ACLF, and it is a dynamic score if you calculate them at uh, baseline day four and day seven. So if the ARC score is the same, uh, the uh, patients with um, low score, grade one, uh, ARC score will have the best survival. Uh, the second one is grade two, and the worst, of, uh, worst in terms of mortality is grade three. And it's dynamic in that the patient, if the patient have a, a score that uh, in, increase from two to three, of course, the mortality will increase. If the score has uh, decreased from a grade two to one or grade two, three to two, the mortality will decrease. And by calculating the ARC score, you end up with values. If it is less than or equal to 10, the patient has better prognosis and you can uh, uh, perform uh, uh, active management's uh, standard medical therapy and also uh, monitoring and observe. If the score uh, uh, decreased by two and no organ failure, they should do well. But if they do not, you have to then uh, switch your treatment strategy. They need organ support, bridging therapy, and they may need a liver transplant. But if the patient has a baseline of ARC score of 11 or more, and uh, if there is, especially if there is extra hepatic organ failure, uh, then the patients do need a liver transplant. If there are organ failure, there is a significant numbers of organ failure, two or more, you should consider support therapy, uh, organ support, uh, uh, and bridge to liver transplant. And at some stage, if the patient do not improve at all, that then the best supportive care is the answer for the patient, and it is futile to proceed to liver transplantation. One of the organ supports that we do practice in our hospital is plasma exchange. Uh, we have the uh, membrane system and the centrifugal system uh, to uh, extract uh, plasma from the patient and replace with fresh frozen plasma. High volume plasma exchange has been shown in randomized control trial in 182 acute liver failure patients. Standard medical therapy with high volume plasma exchange versus standard medical therapy alone. This high volume plasma exchange was exchange of 8 to 12 liters or 15% of the ideal body weight of the patients with FFP. And the uh, uh, sessions required was about uh, the mean sessions required was about 2.4%. So comparing patients with high plas uh, plasma uh, volume exchange compared to standard medical therapy, the transplant-free survival to hospital discharge was higher at 58.7% for those with uh, a high, high uh, volume plasma exchange and uh, only 47.8% with standard medical therapy and the difference was as significant. Even the patients who do uh, fulfill criteria for poor prognosis but were not transplanted, High volume plasma exchange uh, was a significant increase in survival compared to standard medical therapy. And in the high volume plasma exchange group, they found that there was significant improvement in the INR, bilirubin, ammonia, circulatory uh, levels of pro inflammatory cytokines, and the damage uh, associated molecular patterns and IL 8 expression. Next, I would like to talk on uh, decompensated cirrhosis. Back to this uh, diagram on the clinical cause of cirrhosis. 
acute decompensation is uh, defined by the Babino 7 uh, consensus as patients who have overt ascites, where also bleed and overt hepatic encephalopathy, which is grade 2 and above. And this is really the turning point uh, for the patients in that uh, patients with decompensated cirrhosis have dramatically decreased in median survival to about two years compared to 12 years in a person with compensated cirrhosis. So back to this uh, patients with cirrhosis who had uh, emergency hospitalization for acute decompensation, 70% of them are in this decompensated state, not ACLF state. And in these patients, 60% will be stable decompensated cirrhosis with low risk of further decompensation or mortality. But 20% will be unstable decompensated cirrhosis with high risk of further decompensation and mortality. And 20% will actually develop ACLF eventually. So what are the key considerations when you're facing patients with hepatic decompensation? So we have to ask, is the decompensation potentially reversible? For example, abstinence of alcohol in the case of alcohol-related liver disease with decompensation or use of antivirals in untreated chronic viral hepatitis. If it's not reversible, is the patient suitable for liver transplantations? Are there any contraindications to liver transplantations, such as the comorbidity of the patient, the social aspect, and others that have already mentioned, which preclude liver transplantation? And if there's not currently suitable for transplantation, could you make the patient better? Could the patient become more, more suitable, become suitable for transplantation with treatment and intervention? This slide I would like to describe uh, uh, on the model for end-stage liver disease, which is not, some of you may already know this, but uh, just bear with me. MEL has actually a dual purpose in general hepatology and transplant hepatology. In general hepatology, it predicts three months mortality. In transplant hepatology, it's used to uh, prioritize patients on the waiting list. MEL score, Unlike the child pill score, it is objective. There is no subjective uh, variables like ascites or hepatic encephalopathy, and it's measurable. It means only use creatinine, bilirubin, and INR. And with unlike the child pill score, where you categorize patient to A, B, C, MELT score gives you uh, numbers, so expanded the scale, and therefore decrease the number of patients with an identical score, making uh, prioritization easier. And when we compare the mortality of patients with MELT score uh, 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 versus the uh, have a liver transplantation, versus those who are just on the waiting list but did not receive a liver transplantation. At one year post-liver transplant uh, follow-up, we found that liver transplant is actually more hazardous when then remaining on the waiting list if the score of the patient is less than 15. You can see very high hazard ratio of liver transplantation. So the category MELT score of 15 to 17 is the transition point. Hence, we pick a MELT score of 15 uh, above 15 or equal to 15 as one of the criteria uh, indications for liver transplantation in decompensated liver cirrhosis. As liver transplant and the conceptual uh, framework in emergent methodologies and interventions for liver disease uh, evolve, the MELT score needs uh, re evaluation and, uh, uh, in, in order to ensure accurate prognostications and appropriate uh, distribution of the uh, organ donors, mm -hmm. and also improve the clinician's ability to prognosticate and manage end-stage liver disease, which also has uh, improved tremendously. So we have the uh, old child abuse score in the past with the subjective variables of anxieties and cephalopathy, which make it uh, very uh, uh, unuseful. And then we use MELT, we use bilirubin, iodine, and creatinine. But creatinine uh, is an underestimation of renal dysfunction in women compared to uh, male. Hence, it is a disadvantage to the female population. And also, MELT score uh, is not used for, uh, useful for certain uh, etiologies, whereby we use the MELT exception for liver transplant, whereby the mortality risk is actually 
uh, not well represented uh, by the MELT score. And um, then people have started to use MELT sodium, whereby the sodium is included in the components. And sodium is a surrogate of uh, for ascites. But however, it's still not useful in that it didn't take into account of hepatic encephalopathy or acute or chronic liver failure. And then now, uh, people are now using uh, MELT version 3.0 whereby the gender and albumin of the recipients are put into uh, considerations. And uh, this is uh, supposed to help uh, uh, in terms of uh, those uh, 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 gaps that uh, previously uh, uh, in other schools. Donor levels are really precious and our goal should be to maximize both the patient and graft survival. This data from the UNOS uh, United Network of Organ Sharing Database from the US, more than 73,000 adult liver transplant. You can see that uh, the underweight patients, BMI less than uh, uh, 18.5, or the overweight uh, BMI above or even 40 recipients, have significantly lower survival but compared to those in the no more normal weight BMI. Hence, we actually uh, has a cutoff of BMI for indications and contraindications of liver transplant. The recipient age is also matters in terms of liver transplant. This uh, table shows that at various cutoff of uh, uh, age of the recipient, the older age has a poorer post-transplant survival. Here, kind of 70, above 70, have 57, uh, six years post-transplant survival, less than 70 is 73%. And then you have the 60, the uh, above 60s, uh, the five-year survival is 69, less than 60 is 76. And, and basically all of them show older age group has poorer uh, post-transplant survival. And the patients die from uh, uh, either cardiovascular events, or uh, malignancy, or uh, chronic uh, kidney disease, or recurrent liver disease. And newer studies, a population-based cohort study from uh, some closer to home Korea, again show uh, age of the recipient matters in liver transplantation, and uh, the odd ratio for hospital mortality after liver transplant increased with the patient age group, and the cutoff seems to be around 60. And again, then we have a set of cutoff for liver transplant in terms of the recipient age. This slide shows the characteristic and results of different allocation system for hepatocellular carcinoma, which is an indication for liver transplant. So the first one was a Milan criteria. It used a single lesion less than or equal to five centimeter or up to three separate lesions none larger than three centimeters with no evidence of gross vascular invasion and no regional nodal distant uh, metastasis, the far, four years of survival is 85%. And then you have the UCSF criteria, speaker lesions and, um, and diameter. The survival is slightly lower at 80.9% per over five years, still higher than the 50% benchmark. And then you have the up to seven and the Kyoto criteria extended uh, Toronto criteria. And you can see the survival rate drops down as the uh, tumor size uh, uh, increase uh, 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 in terms of acceptance for liver transplant in hepatocellular carcinoma. So we, in Salaya, we practice MTT, multidisciplinary team for hepatocellular carcinoma. We discuss among the radiologist, the surgeon, the oncologist, and ourselves, what is the best option for uh, some of the cases uh, of liver cancer. So what do we do when we have identified a patient who has uh, indications and no contraindications that we could see for liver transplantation? So we go through a, a liver transplant assessment and we fill up this form. Um, you know, we want to know the blood group, the etiology of the liver disease, the indications of transplant, a, a, a detailed uh, medical history and medication history, allergies, social history, and a detailed physical examinations. And then we go through a few tests, uh, the hematology, biochemistry, immunology tests, uh, tumor markers, uh, virology tests, um, and uh, uh, 
other tests for other causes of liver disease. The virality test also include uh, other uh, uh, infection, viral infection that can re may reactivate with liver transplantation that we need to know. And we also look at the respiratory functions and uh, cardiac functions. And uh, sometimes the patients do need uh, to go through a dopamine stress echo, especially patient with ascites. We look at the renal function. Of course, we look at the imaging. Some patients, uh, uh, female above uh, 40 years or above 35 with family history of, of breast cancer need a mammogram. We do endoscopy uh, if they are more than 50 years uh, or they have primary sclerosing cholangitis, they need a colonoscopy to look for colon cancer. Some patients will have a liver histology. We, we also ask our dietitian to review them. We need dental clearance. And a female patient above 35 need gynecological clearance. We also need psychiatric uh, assessment and aesthetic review, and we consider to vaccinate some of these patients pre-transplant, and then we present them in our liver transplant assessment meeting uh, for further management and, uh, and plan, and that could be listed for liver transplantation. Actually, um, liver transplantation assessment is probably one of the potential models that I think uh, food, uh, suit uh, telehepatology in Malaysia. A patient could visit a local doctor if it's considered for a potential liver transplant candidate. They should have a checklist for pre-transplant evaluation and have a tele-evaluation appointment with a, a transplant team and then for the decision on management. And also, this can be used to have a, a regular liver uh, uh, consult as well uh, for second opinion, identify patients who need liver transplantation. So we are moving uh, knowledge but not patients. So if a patient in a waiting list uh, will call, uh, uh, usually um, we may have an uh, uh, organ donation from a disease donor liver transplant program at any time, uh, any time a patient can be called. And the patient uh, will, will uh, a recipient will be identified based on the blood group, uh, the size, and also the person with the highest smell who is uh, well uh, to be transplanted. So uh, various uh, team members will have uh, a lot of uh, work to do in a very short period of time. And the uh, recipient will also have repeated blood tests and investigations. And uh, basically the team will throughout the night and ready for transplant uh, very early in the morning. Post-liver transplant uh, on this uh, the immediate management is by our surgical colleague. On discharge, they are closely followed up initially weekly. And here shows you what are the post-liver uh, transplant complications, which is uh, actually falls very nicely according to the time post-transplant, but not uh, everyone. Uh, the first week, uh, there could be primary graft non-function, biliary complications, acute kidney injury, infections, and the first, uh, after that first uh, month, it could be acute allograft rejections and hepatic artery thrombosis. And the first few months, it could have CME reactivation, uh, in, uh, fungal infection, again, acute liver uh, allograft rejections, biliary complications, hepatic artery thrombosis. Hepatitis C recurrence now is not a, uh, not a big problem. We have good treatment uh, for hepatitis C. And then uh, at the three to six months, they could have uh, acute rejections, uh, biliary complications, uh, EBV hepatitis. And over six months, they can develop chronic rejections, uh, reactivation of EBV, portal vein thrombosis, disease recurrence, a late hepatic artery thrombosis, or other post-transplant conditions like post-transplant lymphoproliferative disease. And um, in our post-liver transplant follow-up of patients, we uh, uh, assess the patient in general and also the function of the liver and also compliance and adherence to uh, uh, medical uh, advice and, and uh, uh, medications. We also look out for the major side effects of the commonly used immunosuppression. The calcineurin inhibitors, the we mainly use sacrolimus now, can cause renal impairment, infection, high uric acid gout, hypertension, 
high cholesterol, they can develop diabetes, post-transplant, and uh, other new, uh, neurological problems like tremors if the level is very high. Mycophenolate is also used. It can cause leukopenia. It's teratogenic. Corticosteroids, of course, use. It has uh, the usual corticosteroid problems, uh, including like sodium tension, hypertension, infection, uh, osteoporosis, muscle weakness, and others. And also we uh, use the mTOR inhibitors. mTOR inhibitors can cause infections, uh, uh, increased risk of infections, uh, thrombocytopenia, leukopenia, poor uh, wound healing, cause uh, hyperlipidemia, proteinuria, hyperlipidemia, and bone marrow suppression. So this is my last few slides. Um, this is a... Uh, a poster presentation by one of our transplant surgeons, Mr. Rajai. Uh, he recently presented this data on 116 liver transplant done in Slaya Hospital in the last 19 years. You can see uh, in terms of disease donor and liver, uh, living donor liver transplantation, we started very small number of patients and remain very low. And then uh, we have a, sometimes you have more and the bumper year was in 2020 uh, uh, at uh, a very high number of transplant performed. And uh, the recipient survival rate for uh, combined disease donor and living donor liver transplantation at one year and five years was um, 73.9% and 69.9%. Uh, for, for living donor versus disease donor, um, uh, there was no significant difference in terms of survival. We uh, have better survival uh, in the first year uh, than the fifth year. And the factors uh, contributing to survival is uh, young age of transplantation and, and a low milk score. So ladies and gentlemen, um, the take home messages is uh, we have a small transplant program. Uh, with respectable uh, recipient survival rates at uh, one and five years. Um, I hope I have uh, explained what are the indications and uh, who to refer. Uh, remember, there are three types of liver failure. The acute liver failure as, and the acute and chronic liver failure are uh, emergencies. So it's important to identify them, make the right diagnosis early, apply a scoring system, uh, you may save a person from going to uh, acute liver failure and ACL if you treat them early. Uh, do consider uh, if they have uh, contraindications uh, glaringly, like social and other medical conditions that preclude uh, liver transplantations, and uh, there may be reversibilities. The best approach is still to catch the liver disease early and treat early. Thank you very much for your attention, uh, and I'll be happy to answer any questions.